Thank you for joining us today for another exclusive interview sponsored by Imovet. Help your horses reach their maximum potential with the Imovet's line of natural homeopathic products. I'm your host today, Aurelian Jermian. Today we are joined by Debra Mihalov, a prominent figure in Arabian racing. With first class targeting the prestigious $8 million dirham President's Cup, We'll explore the rising prestige of Arabian racing and the exciting prospect from Deborah's stable. From nurturing young talents to campaigning established champion, we'll delve into her breeding program, key bloodlines, and plans for upcoming major races. Stay tuned for an engaging conversation with a leader in the world of Arabian horse racing. So thank you so much for having you here, Deborah. It's wonderful to be with you. Good morning. Good morning, indeed. So with first class targeting this 8 million um, dirham President's Cup, could you tell us a little bit more about other promising horses in your stable that, you know, we might see competing in major races soon? Well, we have one other promising horse that is in the Middle East right now. His name is Winds of Fortune, and he is a Maimou Manlao uh, son, and we have quite uh, high expectations of him as well. He started to show a lot of promise last year. He won twice in the UAE, and then we sent him to England, and he won in England, and um, he was uh, um, had a very nice race at Goodwood, uh, finishing six, a respectable six. It was his first out. Um, in a while. And so we were very hopeful that he is going to show us some promise. Excellent. Very well. And for owners and breeders, you know, having multiple horses competing at different levels is very crucial. How do you manage the development of younger horses while also campaigning established performers like First Class? I, I do believe that the way that, that we have had success is here in the United States, we do our groundwork with our horses here. Obviously, it's quite expensive to send horses over to the Middle East or even over to Europe. So we do want them, we want them to have established um, good uh, promising things that we could see before we put that expense in them, possibly having a race uh, put in them uh, at, in the past has been what we preferred um, because of the reduction in Arabian racing in the United States that has uh, decreased. So uh, primarily Texas is where horse racing in the United States is. So we may send younger stock to Texas to see if they are competitive. Mm -hmm. And if they are, then we will go ahead and send them over to the Middle East or over to Europe. Oh, wow. Very interesting. It's a very exciting industry to be in. Um, there aren't a lot of Arabian horses racing, um, but it has a wonderful um, um, base of breeding stock. Um, and it is diversified um, if you let it be. So in my particular case, I have bred an awful lot of mares to De Hess. I represented De Hess here in the United States. And so I have quite a lot of that blood. And now I am trying to outcross that blood. And so what I am now trying to do is take that De Hess line and put it back onto a speed line, which is with a stallion that I have by the name of Our Machine. And he was a Darley winner and a, um, a, a sire of Darley winners. He only has a handful of foals on the ground, but the nice thing about his blood is it's all speed. And I do believe that with all of the French lines that have such wonderful distance and uh, 
in those lines, they need to have a little bit quicker turn of foot. And so I do believe that going back onto the Egyptian line in which this horse uh, is of straight Egyptian breeding, uh, he's a fabulous outcross. And especially onto the Dehes daughters is what I'm, I'm starting to see. So we're um, starting a whole new line <laughs> at Kriron. I can breed, I can continue to breed to a horse like El Mutagis or to Dehes, but we've got to outcross these lines um, for, for the good of Arabian horse racing. And um, there was a time when it was all Viking blood, and then and there was a time when it was all burning sand blood. We as breeders need to improve stock. And the way that you do that is by venturing out. If you keep breeding the same lines over and over again, you will start decreasing your size. You will start enhancing all of your faults. And um, so as a breeder, that, that's not what you want to do. You want to outcross and get yourself a high bred vigor. I can understand. Wow. Would you say there is a high competition in terms of Arabian races or Arabian horses in the United States? In the United States, it used to be. We used to have people like Dr. Armin Hammer, Bob Magnus, the founder of TCI, Alec Cortellas. These were, um, in, and my husband for that matter, these <laughs> were men who, who really blazed Arabian racing in our country um, with the loss of all of them and really no generations to continue these lines on. Um, it, it, it's quite sad to see that it has shrunk like it has. Um, I'm a diehard. <laughs> I believe that uh, the Arabian horse uh, um, is, is the most beautiful creature that God has created. And, <laughs> uh, I, I, and so for me, the, this is what I love to do and my passion for doing it because I feel that Arabian racing could be even bigger than thoroughbred racing worldwide, globally. But you have to have the support of the sheikhs um, because we don't have those kinds of people here in this country anymore doing that promoting or uh, supporting of an industry. To build an industry, it, 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 it costs a fortune and it takes a lifetime. And Arabian racing is just on the threshold of, of racing compared to like the thoroughbred industry. When you think about the fact that they had racing with thoroughbreds, it took them almost like 100 years to get to a, a, a huge, huge purse uh, of a million dollars. Arabians are already, we already have seven million dollar races and we're in our infancy. So if we continue to get support from the Middle East, um, I do believe that uh, with the benefits of what we have by being able to do embryo transfers, artificial insemination, um, we could make this industry even greater than the thoroughbred industry. I, I truly believe that. Wow, that sounds very promising. Yes. It is. Among your current crop of horses, which ones do you feel could follow in first class, you know, hoof prints and compete really at the highest level? He has a full, well, in fact, he has two full sisters. So hopefully one of them will come up. But I'll tell you, I, I'm really liking a beautiful Maymu Manlao filly that um, we've just uh, sent her for groundbreaking. And um, she's very impressive. She's out of our filly called Our Princess and who was a Darley winner and a multiple uh, stakes winner. And um, she, we brought her to Maymu Manlao and this individual, uh, uh, the two of them, um, first class is full sister. Her name is a special class. And uh, the May Moon Manlao filly is called Blue Moon, May Moon, uh, Blue Moon Manlao. And I do believe both of those two fillies are, are very promising. Beautiful, beautiful. As I mentioned several times, you know, the UAE President's Cup and enhanced prize money of 8 million dirham shows the growing prestige of Arabian racing. How does this influence your decisions about, you know, which horses to keep in training and which races to target? In the Middle East, there's a lot of competition. And in a way, it kind of uh, 
places you where you need to be or where, where your horse is at uh, competitively. So when you, when you think about their racing there, their maiden races have 80 horses nominated for a maiden race, just one race. I, I, I am hopeful that this year um, racing over there that they will have expanded their numbers of races um, to facilitate those horses because as a young breeder and person who's getting into racing, your, your funds may be limited. And so you need to make the most of it. And when you can't get in a race because there are 80 horses that are nominated with you, it could be very costly and it will hurt uh, Arabian Racing's program. Uh, you can only keep a horse in, you know, in a maiden status for so long, and then you have to uh, cut loose and and conserve on your expenses. Not everybody is a shake and can afford this, and and we we want the general public to get involved uh, with Arabian racing. We need a good spread of individuals so that our races are competitive uh, to see one owner have four horses in a race is not fair to the rest of the public either but on the same hand too it goes according to the rating and that horse may now be at a position where you know he'll be able to get the win you know even though he has started two times or three times before so it's a little different uh racing in the middle east but in the winter, where do you run? That's where you run. It's the best meat in the world. Uh, uh, that and, and France, you know, in the summertime. So those are the, the key areas in which Arabian racing um, has the ability to really grow. It does here in the United States as well. And I do believe that that it will start picking up again. But in as as you can imagine, the whole world has other needs besides um, horse racing right now. It is slightly complicated, especially with the younger generation. Um, yes. That's the issue. Maybe in the Middle East, I feel like the younger generation is actually, you know, moving forward and actually embracing horse racing or Arabian horse racing. But what do you think about the US or, you know, even Europe, maybe or other parts of the world? Well, I do believe that having other functions, one of the things that I noticed when I was watching um, the the television this weekend and I was watching the races and it's wonderful to see during the races, the uh, saddling paddock areas and the general public areas. And the reason why I say that is because as I invite people here to come and watch the races with me, they see people who are look very much like any other racetrack to wear um, ladies, wear their hats or, or, you know, wear their pretty dresses. And um, it makes uh, racing, you know, it, it shows racing. It educates us on racing in areas like the Middle East that so many people are unaware of um, how much they have been westernized. And I don't know if that's a proper thing to say, <laughs> but it, they have become westernized to a degree. And, and you see that. And I think it would make people more comfortable in wanting to watch those races and be a part of it, because right now they may not know how wonderful it is in the Middle East and how um, women can do what what they would do here in this country for the most part. Excellent. You did mention first class sisters. Yes. Any other particular horses that would excite you as much as first class did at that same stage? L let me say something. It's very difficult to understand <laughs> and to pick what a horse's greatness will end up being. I I remember D.A. Adios, who um, we had three different full crops that we started under saddle, and he was the last one. 
And you would have never thought that he would have turned out to be the the horse that he turned out to be. <laughs> I, I, I mean, he was put in the third group because we didn't think that much of him, <laughs> you know. So to say, can you really see? You see promise, but you really don't know. They have to want it. They have to um, feel comfortable and happy doing it, or they're not going to do it for you. So from that standpoint, no, you cannot judge. And I, I, I look at his full sisters, and yes, I'd like to be hopeful that they're going to be as good. But that doesn't mean that they will be. The, the May Moon Man Lao filly might outdo the first <laughs> class filly, you know, we'll, Time will tell. <laughs> but to, to answer your question, you can only tell that there's promise. But there are so many things that happen when uh, a horse is being prepared for racing that you never thought would happen. And um, injuries take place, accidents happen. And 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 so you never really know. The one that, that that's the least likely ends up sometimes being the one that turns out to be the, the greatest horse. He was, for, in first class's case, he was... Uh, a difficult horse. He still isn't an easy horse to ride. It's why he was gelded because he was, um, uh, we thought we could have, he could reach his potential if he was a gelding. And at that time, I thought I was going to stop breeding at that time. But um, so there was no sense in keeping a stallion. Um, so it, it, in, in this particular case, look at what he turned out to be. <laughs> no. But had we kept him whole, he may not have developed or earned or been able to achieve the greatness that he has achieved. So we've been very fortunate and we hope that he will come back and uh, uh, we'll have fun with him this season. And uh, he'll al he always makes us proud. I mean, even when he finished last, we, we understood the reasons why that took place. And that's the one thing that uh, um, we've always enjoyed racing. Uh, you can see what takes place in a show ring. Uh, it's one person's opinion on a given day or three people's opinion on a given day. So for us, racing was where my husband and I uh, felt that we wanted to develop our program towards. And so that's that's what we did. Excellent. There must be quite a lot of pressure in terms of decision-making. And um, also, what was I going to say? I lost my... Um... Well, it's a responsibility. It's a big well, responsibility when you breed, especially when you breed... Um, a great horse. And we've been fortunate to breed a good couple great horses, not only in this setting, but also in the world of endurance and um, in having uh, treasured moments achieve what she was able to achieve in, in her greatness. Uh, she's a, a mare that we bred that uh, um, Jeremy Reynolds uh, has taken to Tevis. He's won it twice. And last year when he won it, he won it in 15 hours and 14 minutes, a time totally unheard of. And he did it bridleless. And, and, and the reason why I mention that is, is it's the foundation that you put into your breeding stock that allows it to go on to other disciplines, be it dressage, be it jumping, be it um, endurance or, 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 or the racetrack. But we feel the racetrack is where you get your foundation and it, it, it helps you call if you are a true breeder so that you are breeding for the very best. It's a big responsibility because when you do breed that, then people expect that of that horse all the time when it's racing. And they don't understand that just like an athlete, they peak at certain times. And you need to give that horse the opportunity to peak and then you let them down and you let them rest and, and let the bone layer and heal if it's been bruised. And so you, and, and not to mention you're developing lung capacity, all of that takes time just as, as any athlete. And, and so you, people need to be aware of that, that Horses aren't great 100% of the time, consistently, year after year after year. They, It's almost unheard of. 
uh, really. <laughs> Even <laughs> Secretariat got beat. You know, Man of War got beat. <laughs> and I love the fact that Man of War got beat by a horse by the name of Upset. So it, <laughs> that isn't <laughs> ironic. <laughs> but yes, they all get beat. <laughs> that is funny. And you do, you also have that, you know, that horse personality that also is involved into that as well. Yes. Well, it, there's nothing more exciting than to watch something that you have fold out, nurtured, then taken it to its its next level of discipline and watch it become very successful. It's like kids. I don't have any children. So for me, my horses are my children. <laughs> so I've, I've been very fortunate to have some really fabulous graduates. <laughs> good kids. And, and but let me tell you, that would not have happened if it wasn't for the trainers. And I'll tell you, the lady to your left or on my screen to the right, Amanda, <laughs> if it wasn't for Amanda, who helps keep me straight, she is she talks with our trainers, no matter this horse has had five trainers in the case of first class. And so you can imagine all of the adjustments and the changes. And I, with so many things that have been going on in my life lately, I have been totally uh, relying on Amanda Roxborough, who has helped guide me along with our trainers in the various countries that this horse has raced in. And um, if it wasn't for somebody like Amanda, I probably um, would have a much more difficult time. I, When I had leased the horse the first time, Nasser al Kebe was uh, the uh, leasee and, uh, or a, a, as a lease is, an owner of the horse at that time. And he managed the horse for us and he did a, a superb job. And so upon uh, severing that lease, that time had, had ended, um, Amanda has stepped in and now manages. Um, and maybe Amanda, you'd like to say uh, what our, our philosophies are with our training and, and that. Yes, absolutely. Well, number one thing is it all starts at the top, which is Deb Mahalo and her commitment to the animal as a horse and an athlete, as she mentioned, um, making sure that the horse is able to perform. Uh, you have to listen to your horse, which Deb loves to do. And we try to surround ourselves and pick trainers and team and locations for actually these horses to excel the best. Um, after Deb took back control of first class he came back from France went directly to Doug's barn and um, it was a bit of a challenge because he'd had a very tough couple of years in a row so uh, we he did quite well last season but we knew that he really needed to have a full rest and um, picking England for last summer was really primarily to give these horses a time to take kick back a little bit get where they needed to be physically and emotionally. And again, that takes commitment to dedication. And Deb was huge with uh, putting that in the forefront. So that makes my job easy because we're doing what's right for the horses. Um, and then picking, you know, an area in England where they can relax and then having the planning of picking where we could get to the next stage to get these horses to excel, which was racing them lightly in England and then focusing on the UAE upcoming season, which is what we've done. They're both back in Doug Watson's care right now. Uh, first class just ran uh, last weekend in the prep for the President's Cup, and he ran a fantastic race. Um, he'd only been off the plane two weeks, um, and he traveled well, but still, that always takes a little bit out of an athlete. So for him to come back and run on Sunday, uh, this past Friday, November 15th, and perform so well, he, was, he actually showed his old true grit self, which we're very proud of. And uh, he was, you know, he had full force of himself right down to the wire, just got beat a length and a quarter uh, for the whole thing. So we're very excited about that because it's not just about the physical, it's about the emotional uh, with a lot of horses. And he's a classic example of that. Um, you can't just manage him with the timetable. It's you have to, it's a lot of kit glove managing, which takes a team, make sure that everything in the barn is done right for him. 
Um, I wouldn't say he's a diva, but he can be a little high maintenance, but it's <laughs> totally okay with us because, um, you know, so every athlete is different. They're individual. Some can take a little bit more. Um, some have to be really, really handled well because you're getting what's out of them, but it doesn't all come from physical as Deb mentioned. It comes from internal, their heart. And uh, he has it, but you have to respect him. So seeing his performance last weekend was absolutely thrilling for us. Um, it it gives the commitment that we put in the time and Deb's commitment, you know, both financial and timetable. And she allows us to, to do what's right for her horses. And uh, so the rewards hopefully will come. Um, Wins of Fortune, again, absolutely love this horse. He's developed, you know, just in a later stage, he's five already. Um, coming six this year, but I think he's going to blossom in the next 12 months. So we're excited, very excited. Excellent. Very nice. So glad that we gave them the time off in England this summer. You can't really rust. We, we've tried rusting our horses in the Middle East in the summer, and, and, and it's just not conducive uh, to, to get the best out of that athlete. And so We've learned that, and um, so in the future, um, we will send our horses out of the Middle East come summer so that they can either be in France or in England to um, let their heads down, be a horse, and giving first class that five months, which which is costly when you figure he's not bringing in any money, but we feel that the horse needed the time off, and so we gave him that five months off in England. I mean, what's not to like about being in England for five months in the summer or something? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he enjoyed himself. <laughs> uh, Wynn's got a little bit of a rest, but he didn't get five months. He only got two months, I believe. But it's still, they, they do need to go someplace else to where they can. And planning um, planning their schedule is the most important part, too, to benefit the program, which is Deb Mahal of investing in a program to hopefully be rewarded. Um, not that we you know, demand from our horses, but that's the goal. And if you're in horse racing and you're breeding and your commitment, you are in it as business. So we try to make the best business decisions, lay a plan, um, work with their physical goals. And also so we can put them in the right races so they can be successful. And, uh, you know, that, that keeps the ball rolling. Excellent. With Arabian racing, you know, offering such significant prices, um, at the moment, how do you balance campaigning your current runners while also preparing for the next generation? Amanda, I'm going to let you answer that because it's more of a training answer, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, it's about, uh, you know, the teamwork. Deb has a really great team in America, as she mentioned. Um, Lynn Ashby has been a trainer for Alan and Deb for decades now and had enormous success in the Arabian racing in America. And she continues to be part of Deb's team here. That's where the young, uh, almost two-year-olds are right now, working with her team, Christian Swan, who rode a lot of races for Deb and won. Um, she's involved in all the groundwork going on right now. So it's about, you know, putting them in the right places at the right time with the right people. And uh, so right now, we take the younger horses and we put them where they need to be in development and going at their pace. Um, as an athlete, you know, it's it starts as a two-year-old with the Arabians. They don't race until they're three, unlike the thoroughbreds, which is a very big benefit physically and emotionally. So they're going to do some groundwork, then get some more time off, keep, continue to grow. And, uh, you know, that will be done here in America. And then we will start strategically figuring out a time when it's best to send them back to, you know, into whatever journey their training is, depending on their physical and emotional well-being but uh it's 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 like building a strategy plan in any business um that's what this is with the horses we take them individually uh we can all have you know our thoughts and dreams on paper but we have to follow each horse individually and know where they are and put them in the best areas to grow perfect and beyond first class and the president's cup what other major targets are you considering, you know, for your stable in the coming months? 
I would well, like to see. Go ahead, Amanda. If you uh, like we to. actually <laughs> have just been discussing that this past week. Um, you know, it's about picking the the races that suit these horses where we know they can be competitive. Um, again, the UAE season is just beginning and the condition book comes out, the stakes calendar comes out. So what we do is based on each horse, we have the two over there now, we're picking the ultimate goals for each horse in stakes caliber and obviously with first class. His plan has kind of been quite easy to follow over the last few years. He's hit a lot of major targets and been very successful. He's won, you know, 2022, he won three $1 million races following the program of the Jewel Crown, the Saudi race, and then back to Maidan for the ultimate Kahala Classic, which was, you know, an almost unheard of feat. Um, I guess we would say Al Ghadir is his next, uh, you know, predecessor in that, having success in that way. So our goals are to try to get him back on that program. Um, again, we have a lot of lovely choices. I believe there's something like um, 22 graded to listed stake races in the United Arab Emirates calendar this season from November through to April. Um, seven group one races, five group two races, um, I believe six group three races and the rest are listed. But the opportunity there to pick something for your horse it, you know, there's no better place to be than to try to get your horses to group races. So we're very lucky to be there. That's why we're there. And uh, so we have picked races for both of them that will be in their best competitive element with the most su success. So we're working with that right now. And then again, we'll just follow our horses week to week on their physical abilities, working with Doug Watson and his team, obviously closely. And between Doug and myself and Deb, uh, we're going to try to hit all the good markers. Obviously, Kahala Classic is in uh, April this year. Um, there are some really lovely races. Um, the Maktoum Challenge, I think we'd like to try to approach that this year, which we did last year. Get them another race on the dirt before the Kahala Classic. And again, the most exciting thing is he's really, he's arrived in Dubai. First class has arrived. Um, so we're really excited about his future this year. And then same with Winds of Fortune. He's had a lot of great success there last year. He was very, uh, you know, very promising for us. In fact, that good race, he was only beat nine lengths to Al Ghadir, uh, which, you know, as a young horse, we were very impressed with that. He finished sixth. So that was exciting. So I think he's definitely ready to springboard into the group races. And so we have a lot of choices there. So we actually are just going over the list of ones. And again, it'll calendar is based on our individual horse. So luckily we have some very nice choices coming up throughout this calendar to hopefully get him grade or group one, um, you know, hopefully a winner that this season. So that's our, those are our goals. Excellent. Very good. Well, thank you so much. That was the last question. Well, thank you ever so much. We really appreciate you listening to us. Of thank course. you and for that your support great. of Arabian racing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.